Okay, everyone. Yes, I am Matthew John. Welcome to Discover Your Star Origins. Welcome to day four of Portal to Ascension. Uh, this has been such a wonderful conference. I've been enjoying watching all the uh, speakers and all the wonderful hosts. Uh, what a great job Neil uh, is doing putting this together. So I'm so grateful to be on. And I'm absolutely thrilled to bring you my presentation on discovering your star origin. So a little bit about me first. Um, I know, you know, uh, Joan, you did just, so, or, or, I'm sorry, Michelle, just a, a wonderful job of, um, you know, introducing me. But uh, I, a little bit of my path um, when it comes to uh, discovering my own star origins, right? I grew up, I would say, you know, a pretty normal kid, as normal as I could be. I mean, you know, my mom tells me that when I was younger, I absolutely was obsessed with looking at the stars with, you know, um, you know, looking at the moon and uh, and, you know, the man on the moon when I was three years old, driving the, the car seat in the back seat. Um, but other than that, you know, my father was an atheist. My mother was more into the, into the new age stuff. That's where I got these new age genes from uh, my mother. But, um, you know, I was an atheist myself, like for most of my teenage years, my, my 20s. And I really thought that, you know, re anything religious, I thought that anything spiritual was really silly. I thought all my mom's oracle cards and books and, you know, and crystal music and all that was really pretty silly. And everything changed for me very unexpectedly in my 20s. I was in a place in my life where, you know, again, being an atheist, I thought that life was just about trying to have fun, trying to make the best of it, trying to make money, uh, trying to, you know, uh, be, as, I, as, I guess, as happy as you can as being a human being. And I had a very unexpected psychedelic experience when I, I had, yes, I had ingested some psilocybin mushrooms, but for me, back in my early 20s in Buffalo, New York, you know, what were mushrooms for? They were to have a good time on a Friday night, right? Along with a few uh, Labatt Blues or Molsons for those of you that are watching the Bills game now and, uh, you know, uh, uh, familiar with Western New York, right? So for me, it was just kind of a party thing. But on one kind of fateful Friday night in uh, September in Buffalo, New York, I had ingested some mushrooms and I felt a way, I, had, I remember being in a bar and I felt in a way that I had never felt before. And I was like, whoa, this is different. I can't be here anymore. And I left the bar and I just started wandering the streets. Those of you that know, I believe this was uh, around UB South Campus. It was, uh, it was that area. And I just started wandering through the streets of Buffalo and then I just started feeling not that I was wandering, but I was actually being led. And it was the weirdest feeling. I was like, you know, 22 years old. I never experienced anything like this before. And I said, you know what? Okay. And I kept being led. It was almost as if my, there was like a string on my heart and it was pulling me. Right. And I found myself being led to some weird wooded area behind a bar, the least spiritual place you could ever imagine the weirdest place you could ever think of for someone to have a spiritual awakening. And there was, it was a circle. There was a tarp where it looked like homeless people had been. There was a, uh, you know, a bunch of beer cans looked like, looked like teenagers had been there partying. And I was pushed to the ground by this force far greater than me. And as I lay w w on my back, looking up at the trees around me, all of a sudden, all of the trees around me, the every corner of every leaf had like a golden globe, like a golden ornament. And in each of these golden ornaments, there were these little people waving at me. And I felt overcome with this orgasmic bliss. I wrote down this term and I'll never forget it. I told my mom the experience after that it was like a cosmic orgasm that 10,000 times more powerful than any physical orgasm. I couldn't move. I was so overcome with pleasure. And as I looked into these, into the trees and again, every corner of every leaf, there was like this golden globe. There was a little being there waving at me in each of these. And there were hundreds of these. And I recognized in that moment that, whoa, these are different versions of myself. And I felt that in that moment, some of these versions of self were from 
other lifetimes on earth. But also in that moment, I felt that some of these versions of myself were actually beings from other planets. And I was like, whoa. And that changed my life in the most incredible way. I never turned back after that. I had no interest in kind of being a part of normal society anymore. I had no interest in, you know, just kind of what I was interested in, in before, which again, just trying to, you know, be as happy as, as I can as a human and make enough money and all that and, and, and find a, a partner. I became obsessed after that um, experience I had with figuring out what it was about, right? What, what happened and, you know, okay, I, in that moment, my atheism dissolved, right? And I knew that there's something much greater. Like I had really, in that moment, been in touch with the universe, right? And so I wanted to discover, okay, what are past lives like, and how do they affect me in the current moment? What are lives, these off-planet lives, right? What are these, um, these lives that I've had on other planets? How is that even possible, right? Because it seems so weird. Like, really, I can actually come from another planet to here? What? Right? So I became obsessed with figuring out all of this. Fast forward a couple of years, I had another experience that, again, I have to thank. Uh, my, uh, it, actually, it was, uh, it was LSD this time. And it, it was the day after. And those of you that have ever done a psychedelic for, you know, for a spiritual purpose, right? You know, there's this kind of hangover period a day or a couple of days after where you feel really like aligned, right? So I was in this place of like alignment and in this place of feeling really uh, connected. And I was, <laughs> I was at a, a public library because I was traveling and I was just perusing the internet. I don't know for what. And I came across some random like GeoCity style 1998, you know, circa 1998-esque uh, website that was about star seeds. And, and I never heard the term before that day. And I looked down the list of like some of the descriptions of star seeds, right? And uh, when I came across Sirius or in Syrians, I stopped. And I'm like, that's me. And I didn't know how I knew it in that moment. I just knew that in that moment, I was feeling very connected, right? I was feeling very elevated. And I just knew it. I just knew that that was me, right? So that was the first piece for me. Later on, I had a visit from, uh, I was in my parents' home and I came out of the shower and I turned around and behind me, there was a blue avian extraterrestrial. And I know if I was on any other network other than this network or Alan's network or, or Jones network or, you know, uh, Jeff Mars network, people would, you know, think I'm mental, right? But there was a blue avian ET behind me. It, he was in his astral form. He was about eight feet tall, giant wings, and he was just looking at me. And I felt that feeling again of just being overcome by bliss, right? And I knew in that moment, oh my God, this is why I've always been obsessed with airplanes. Like when I was, uh, I don't know, five years old, like, you know, I, my mom and I would always travel to see relatives and we would, um, you know, we would, uh, always get to visit the cockpit right you know back back in the day you could bring your kids up in the cockpit i would be just amazed at all the controls and everything right they give you the little wings i, I realized why i always like dreamed of, about being a bird right and why even to this day i'm obsessed with uh uh you know birds i i feed the birds like consistently i make sure my birds are always fed right you know in my yard and okay and then that was that piece and then another piece a few years later i started to research the orion wars right which i think you know we talked a little bit about in this conference and i realized then i'm like wow this is another piece i've been there i just knew that i was there in the orion wars i didn't know how i knew i just knew that somewhere here you know i was in the orion wars right and so I knew that was another piece. And then the Andromeda Galaxy, when I started learning about the nature of the Andromeda Galaxy and how the Andromeda Galaxy and the uh, Milky Way Galaxy are actually on this collision course to become a super galaxy, 
I was like, oh my God, I actually have been there too, right? So that was my journey in discovering my star origins. And I want to help you discover your star origins. So let's do a little presentation. Going to click present, right? Share screen. And we're going to share. Find the right window. Um, Best way to do it, Matthew, is share yeah. entire screen. Okay. And then, and then bring, select the screen. Bring up on my end. Yep, yep. Okay, let's do that. So uh, share entire screen, share, mm -hmm. and then. Got it. Boom. So, Got yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So discovering your star origins. Okay. A little bit about the difference between earth seeds and star seeds, because there absolutely is a difference. Okay. Not everyone is a star seed. You know, it's very likely that most people or maybe even all people that are watching this call are star seeds, right? Watching this, uh, this conference, but um, it's, it, there's, probably a few of you that are earth seeds the difference being an earth seed the other term for an earth seed is an organic consciousness and an organic consciousness is a soul that originated in the earth realm was donated from the planetary consciousness of earth itself earth is a conscious being just as a woman an earth woman can give birth to a brand new human earth herself can give birth to a brand new soul. How fascinating is that? Any planet that is at a, you know, the requisite frequency can give birth to a brand new soul. Any star system can give birth to a brand new soul. Any galaxy can give birth to a brand new soul. So if you are an earth seed, it means your soul was born essentially here in the earth realm. Your soul then elevated through the vibrations, through the dimensions. Okay. You went through, just as the Hindus teach us, you went through a journey as an earth seed of being, you know, different types of plants, different types of animals, different types of, um, and, and the animal kingdom is so diverse, right? Especially on earth. You know, think of the difference between the life lessons and, and the types of experiences that a mosquito can have, right? You know, a mosquito's, uh, uh, life mission is to go around and I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Right. Versus a, an elephant. Right. I, I was watching a, a video on, uh, on social media last night of an elephant at the, the San Diego zoo that they were taking around to show all the other animals. And the elephant was, you know, fascinated with exuberance at the, uh, at um, the seals. Right. And it's like, you know, that's a very high level of consciousness to be able to uh, do that. So, um, if you're an earth seed, you have many different incarnations as an animal. Eventually, you make it up to the third density where you get to experience being a human. Okay. Um, as a star seed, and, and from there, you know, you do continue on in your ascension journey to the fourth density and above, right? Um, just as star seeds do. As a star seed, you come as a fractal from somewhere else. You come as a fractal from another planet or another a star system or another galaxy. Again, a new soul can be created from, from any of those but you have already ascended to a very high level. You've already ascended to a very, very high level in these, uh, where, if, from wherever you came from. And from there, you have reached such a high level and we would categorize this in my model, six density or above. Six density or above, you've reached the requisite level where you're able to what's called fractalize. To be able to fractalize, you're, you're basically, it's, it's another type of spiritual birth. Again, just as a woman can give birth to a new being, an animal can give birth, right? Uh, salmon can can lay eggs that are fertilized, right? That become it's another type of birth where essentially, as a soul, you're creating a mini me soul, right? Remember the Austin Powers movies, mini me, right? You know, right? He, yeah, think of it like that. You're creating a mini me soul and you're sending it somewhere else with focus and tension. We have such power, these places we come from in the, in the stars, right? We have such power. We're because we're able to draw upon the entire collective. If you're sixth density, you're drawing upon the entire collective of a planet. If you're eighth density, you're drawing upon the entire collective of a star system. If you're tenth density, you're, draw you're drawing upon the entire collective of a galaxy, right? 
you're drawing upon that immense amount of energy. I mean, think about how much energy the sun has to power this entire planet, right? It, it's an in, uh, it's an innumerable, you know, un, un, uh, fathomable amount of energy. And you're able to draw upon all that energy to create what's called a fractal. That fractal you can, can then direct with focus intention to somewhere, whether it's in, uh, whether it's on Earth or whether it's Alpha Centauri. And in general, as a star seed, you are downstepping, right? Meaning, for example, the oldest part of my soul, as I understand it, would be from the Andromeda galaxy. So that old, old elder part of my soul or my galactic consciousness that comes, and this is one of the things I do for you, um, or any of you that have already had readings with me or know me, um, and, I've, and I've done this for you, you know, with my clients, I give them kind of a visual diagram of, okay, your soul began here, then it went here, then it went here, then it went here. Because there's different levels to our galactic conscious, to our galactic soul. So I came from the Andromeda galaxy originally. I came to Sirius, right? From Sirius, that's kind of my hub in the Milky Way. I also wanted to have experiences as a Blue Avian, experiences as an Orion, and then, of course, on Earth. So I downstep twice. I downstep from, my understanding at least, I downstep from the Andromeda galaxy to come to, to Sirius. I downstepped again to go from Sirius to Earth. Every time you downstep, think of it as if you're turning your radio dial, right? Victor, I'm sure you, you're listening. You know this, like, you know, night, WFAN, you know, 660, sports radio, 66, WFAN, you know, on your radio dial, right? Or whatever. You know better, better than me, Victor. <laughs> um, so you're turning your radio dial down, right? To down step your frequency. Because we have to match the baseline frequency of the place we're going. Okay, of the of the time space envelope that we're going. Time is dependent on space. So wherever whichever planet or whichever star system that you are intending to go to, there's a certain frequency. Again, it's like a radio station. It's like Earth is nine, you know, Earth would be at the at the very low end of the uh probably of the AM uh spectrum, you know, five what's the first one? Five seventy, right? Or five sixty, right? Um whereas, you know, think about uh you know the other the the higher uh, places we're coming from is like Sirius XM, right? You know, you're coming from Sirius XM channel 334 and you're downstepping all the way to Earth. It's like all the way at the low end of the AM dial, right? So you have to, and that's why as star seeds, we feel lost. We feel like this is not really our home. We feel like all of the bullshit on this planet, all the war, all the, the greed, all the corruption, right? we don't get it intuitively we're just like I, I i don't this doesn't feel right i feel like there's something greater than we're just like pretending here well that's because you are because you come from a place where you know if you come from the pleiades or sirius or arcturus etc there's no war there's no greed there's no health issues there's no no corruption there's none of this stuff right that we experience here one exception is, is those that are orion starts like myself that were a part of the Orion Wars, there may have been an intention, well, may have, there was an intention from your soul to experience that aspect of the galactic games where negative draconian beings were going around conquering, right? And you, for whatever reason, wanted to be a part of that, okay? And actually, interestingly enough, a lot of uh, all Orion stars I've ever seen have decided to incarnate in at least one or two lifetimes on earth where they're part of an army and they're kind of playing the, the roles of the, of the bad guys, actually. They're playing the roles of the bad guys because they, and, and also then, you know, I, I remember um, my first past life regression, which happened shortly after I had this experience that I, you know, uh, when, when told you about at the top of the hour here, um, top of my talk, you know, shortly after that, I had my first past life regression. And I saw I was in um, in, in Kazakhstan and my, you know, in like ancient Mongolian times. And my village was raided. My village was raided by, you know, it was a different ethnic group. And they just wanted to eliminate all of us. And they pretty much did. Right. You know, I saw my parents in that life just being maimed essentially in front of me. And that's like the Orion part of me that wanted to experience that. And then the Orion part of me, 
you know, was like a, a gangster in, in, in New Jersey in another life. And, you know, one and, and, and other, there was probably another military life or something like that, but I wanted to experience the other side. So as an Orion being, you're going to want to experience both sides of like war, deceit, corruption, and uh, sometimes even genocide in certain lives. Right. Anyways, um, there's a specific reason why you pick the lifetimes you do on earth. And a lot of it does have to do with your, your experience, your karma as a, uh, as a star being, okay, as a galactic being. Um, why do many Milky Way star seeds? Yeah, okay, can you be from more than one place? Absolutely. How, and, and I would say about, you know, I, I've been focusing this topic as one of my two main areas of research for the past decade. The other main area of research is uh, the soul plan. And I also like to see how they, as I was talking about, how they kind of kind of intertwine. About half of people I found are from one place, and about half are from many places. Okay, why many Milky Way star seeds originate from the Andromeda galaxy? Why many star seeds originate from the Andromeda galaxy? Well, the reason being is because the galaxies are on this collision course to merge with one another. Okay to merge with one another and become a super galaxy. It's the next step in the Milky Way's evolution. It's the next step in the Andromeda galaxy's evolution to merge completely together. Because of that, a large portion of beings in the Milky Way are actually the soul, your soul originates from the Andromeda galaxy. Star seeds and soul groups. You might have heard that most um, of most Earth beings, if not all, have a soul group of 12. And on another level, that is you. You are your soul, but you're also the soul group. And those of you that are the light workers and awakenings and star seeds, a lot of you basically are on the leading edge of your soul group. You're the ones pushing the soul group forward. You're pushing the evolution of the soul group forward, right? And in general, star seeds, okay, want to conglomerate group into these soul groups of 12. But it, and, and a lot of times, almost always really, the other beings in your group are going to be beings from other, uh, from you've known from off planet essentially. Like, okay, you know, maybe my, my dad, maybe, I don't know, maybe we knew each other on Sirius or, um, you know, other people in my soul group, maybe we knew, know each other from Sirius, right? But not all of them. Some of them will you know, you'll, you'll not have had off planet experiences with, and it's just, there's a certain resonance. Soul groups are, are based off of resonance, which is why, you know, like attracts like. So star seeds attract other star seeds in the soul group. And, um, you know, earth seeds generally will group with other earth seeds. Um, I'm not going to go into abductions and sightings because we actually talked about that on the experiencer panel on Thursday, January 11th, on, right here on, on these channels. So, Go back and watch that. It was Victor, Craig, and and I, and Neil. So I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. Um, we will talk about different types of benevolent ETs. Can you be a star seed from a malevolent ET group? It's a fascinating topic. Um, my understanding is actually no. If you're a reptilian star seed, you're from one of the positive reptilian groups. There are no true gray star seeds. In I, I believe it's people misunderstanding the grays for the Zeta Reticuli. Okay, I talked about Earth Seeds and Star Seeds. Okay, the densities. This is adapted from the channel work of my very good friend Todd Deviney. Okay, Todd Deviney. Uh, you can go and uh, if you want to check out his books, they're called Expansion for Ascending Consciousness, also on my YouTube channel. I um, Oh, this will be good motivation for me to repost. YouTube took down the first, like, epic three-hour collaboration between Todd and I for, you know, I don't know, you know, what th they thought we were talking about the pandemic or something, right? But um, I'm going to repost that. This will be good motivation for me to repost that now that you guys are seeing this. So the second one is up there, though. Um, I'll be creative. Uh, I'll, I'll post it under a different name. Anyways, um, this is adapted from his work. He's a dear friend of mine. I love him to death. Uh, first density, I talked about single cell. Mar oh, well, here, here's it works more clearly. First density, single cell microbial life. Second density, plants and animals. Third density, more advanced animals. Again, larger frontal frontal lobe. Think 
your dogs, your cats, your gorillas, your you know monkeys, your uh, giraffes, etc. Uh, fourth through sixth densities, increasing levels of merging with the planetary consciousness. Where are we go right now? Where are we at on the planet? You know, you you might want to think we're in the fifth dimension. We're not. We're in, we're in the third. We're in the third density and dimension, right? We're heading towards the fourth density slash fifth dimension. The fourth density and the fifth dimension are the same thing. We're headed there. We're on our way, right? And you can also break down the densities into octaves. Okay, you can break them down into like musical octaves, 3.1, 3.2 through 3.7. All right, as a planet, we're still probably at that 3.1, 3.2 range. Fast forward 10 years from now, we might be 3.4, 3.5. Fast forward 30, 40 years, maybe we'll all the, we'll be at 3.6 you know, and getting ready to uh, to go into the next um, the next density itself, the fourth, right? At the fourth density, it is, uh, you know, incre it's a true uh, service to other conscious. It's a true um, all are, it, right? You know, separation consciousness is the marker of the third density. I'm a person, you're a different person, you're a different person. We're all trying to get ours. We're all trying to compete for resources. That's the marker of the third density, third dimension, right? The fourth density, fifth dimension is that I am you, you are me, and we're all in this together. Let's operate as one planetary body. And you can see, right right now, we're in a place where governments don't necessarily do what is really good for the people, do they? Well, you get to the fourth density. Now, because we're all operating from this consciousness of I am you, you are me, and we're all in this together, so let's all do what's best for each other. Well, all of a sudden, governments that have transformed into for the people, truly for the people, right? But we're not there quite yet. Fifth density is then going to be a an ascended uh, version of the fourth density, where a more ascended version of the fourth, where actually now you have a holographic body instead of a physical. Fourth density, you're still physical. Okay. Fifth density, you might appear physical, but you're holographic in nature. You have no organs. Okay. Sixth density is a planetary conscious. Okay. At that point, you are both an individual and the collective. At any point, or it, you can either take, at any point in time, you can either take the perspective of the individual or of the planetary collective itself or both simultaneously. Seventh density is a more ascended planetary uh, conscious. Eighth density is system consciousness. Ninth density, a more ascended system consciousness. Tenth density is galactic conscious. Twelfth density is universal consciousness. And who knows what's beyond that? You know, as we've been told, the answer to the universe is 42. Maybe 42 is beyond that, right? Okay, toroidal field. What is a toroidal field? At the third density above, okay, this is not your aura. It's a different model, okay? You have developed a toroidal field. You begin as a single photon, a single, um, okay, a, uh, if I stop sharing for just one second, okay, a single, so I can see what I'm actually showing you guys if you begin as a single photon of light okay then you attract the second photon of light those two photons start to spin around each other those photons separate okay and each go on in their individual paths that's what a twin flame is but a twin flame is different in the third density that's a third density twin flame when it comes to you know if you're if you come from outside of Earth, you've already re-merged. You've already merged again with your twin flame aspect. And a star seed twin flame, just FYI for those that are curious about this, is actually it's another soul. Whereas essentially from the origins of Earth seed, twin flame is the same soul. So that one separates into two. Okay. Then each one starts to attract, magnetically attract more photons around it. Okay, until you get this photonic field that photonic field grows and grows think about a um oh think about like i don't know uh, uh cells like you know under a microscope all conglomerating together that's what it's like right eventually enough photons conglomerate together where you actually then develop what's called a toroidal field where there's an empty column in the in the middle and then up the, the photons go up and around and underneath, and it's a self-perpetuating field, okay? And again, credit to my uh, my good friend Todd for all those wonderful uh, visuals. Let me uh, go back to uh, sharing. 
present, share screen, share screen. Yes, entire screen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, go back to the slides. There we go. Okay, what does it feel like to fractalize? Whoa, what, what an amazing experience, right? Someone's seen it as going through a portal. Seems like a conscious spiritual process that requires a lot of training. So what I was shown many times is like a, a vision of me being on Sirius, like basically in this theater, in this amphitheater. And there was a teacher in front that was presenting like, you know, here we're using this ancient technology, right? I've got a green screen and uh, I, I, I don't even want to pay Microsoft. So I'm using, you know, Office Libra, right? The free version, you know, because F Microsoft. But um, anyways, I saw, I saw a vision of like, okay, you know, I'm in this theater and on the stage, there's this teacher presenting like, using holographic models, like 3D holographic models, like R2-D2 was trying to show Princess Leia, right? And, uh, and, and you know, he, he kept messing up and, you know, I think Le if Leia would have just hit him harder, it would have, well, it was Leia and, and it was the young Obi-Wan, right? They were trying to get the R2-D2 to work so they could show, I got to watch Star Wars again. But um, that's what I saw. It was like this holographic projection and they were teaching us they were training us, preparing us how to be star seeds, like how to how to go to a different planet. And we all had kind of like information in front of us. Again, not like this ancient technology here where we have an iPad. It was like this holographic piece of technology with, with all these images and information about Earth itself that we were kind of looking at as we got prepared to go to whichever planet we were going to go to. Like, the woman next to me wasn't going to go to Earth. She was going to go somewhere else, right, in uh, in the Milky Way. So uh, we get it, we get trained to do it because it's a it's a very difficult process. And you know why why do we like feel so lost as star seeds here? Because we miss home. Part of it is missing home, right? We look to the stars, and and we you know why do you think I'm so obsessed with the stars? Like we look to the stars, and we're like, wow it feels so much more comfortable there than here, right? Because we're on an away, an away team journey. Remember in Star Trek, you know, they, they beam down, you know, uh, on the away team, right? And then, you know, Scotty, you know, right? Um, that's, what, that's what it's like. We're on this away mission. So, of course, we miss home. And so it's not easy to come from Sirius or to come from Pleiades or Arcturus, et cetera, and come here. This is a very cold, um, you know, emotionally cold overall, a, a very war torn a very sick you know disease ridden you know polluted planet if we're being honest right so it's not easy to come here but why do we come here we come here for a couple of reasons we come here because we want to experience what it's like to be in duality so we're coming from places where we've overcome we've overcome the need for disease karmically we've overcome the need for war karmically we've overcome uh the need for you know any uh, lower vibrational experiences of fear or of abandonment or of conflict. We've overcome all that. And we're living basically in this blissful state. So we want to come back to Earth in order to rediscover, re-experience what this is all about, what it's like to be in the third dimension, because it actually adds a tremendous amount of, of we could call it value or we could call it a Kind of a frequency upgrade to our galactic soul to successfully complete a mission think of it as a mission again like the away team in star trek to successfully complete a mission of coming to a lower vibrational planet and evolving it's like think about you know when you go into a pool right when when i was a kid I, i'd sit in the pool on the buoys and i kind of you know float back and forth it was the funnest thing to like kind of ride you know but you push one of the, the buoys in the pool you know separating the deep end from the shallow end well, what happens as soon as you let go of your, you know, the buoy with your hand, it pops back up. Okay. That's what, what it's like vibrationally, where when we're fractalizing, we're intentionally pushing ourselves down. Okay. Intentionally pushing ourselves down to a lower vibration. And then we let go and we see what journey our soul, our, our, our soul now that now that's on earth takes us 
to vibrationally ascend again. And at first, the journey is going to take us through this experience of balancing karmas, experiencing positive and negative karmic experiences, right? Some lifetimes where we hurt others, some lifetimes where we're hurt by others, some lifetimes where we're very spiritual, sometimes some lifetimes where we're very material. And the whole gamut, you know, there are our souls, whether we're star seeds or earth seeds, want to experience all 12 sides of the zodiac wheel and, and both light and dark aspects of the zodiac wheel over and over and over again. Okay. So we want to experience what it's like, but eventually we want to rise back up to the surface and then poop, pop back up. Okay. Reasons we come to earth to experience duality and novel experience. That's what I was talking about. Okay. And also to contribute to the planetary ascension here as an act of service, because the Milky Way herself has said it's time for the entire galaxy to essentially ascend vibrationally. It's time. Okay. The, the, the experiment of um, negative, you know, this virus, we could say, of negative consciousness, which are the, you know, draconian reptilian beings that are essentially it, the, the root cause of all the problems on planet Earth. Okay. It, they're, they're, it's not just here, but they've run amok throughout the galaxy causing not only Orion Wars, but literally every problem in the galaxy. And the Milky Way herself, the consciousness of the Milky Way, the enlightened being that she is, has said, okay, that was a fun experiment, but enough's enough. And she said that every planet throughout her galaxy has to ascend now. So that's why star seeds by the, the millions are coming to Earth. I believe that every child being born now is a star seed. I don't know if that's 100%, but it's probably close um because this is the time it's the star seeds that are pushing the planetary ascension forward okay we're the leaders and the the new generations are you know why do you think the new generations are naturally so technologically inclined right well yeah they grew up with iphones but also these are star seeds these are star seeds coming from places of higher technology right so that's it's 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 out of service to bring your codes, energy, knowledge, memories from your home realm here to assist in the planetary ascension as an act of service and to transmit information about Earth back to your home realm, which is especially for those less common starseeds. So those starseeds that I find when I do my starseed discovery sessions that come from other galaxies, for example, so often or, or really less common, um, you know, less common uh, star origin places in the Milky Way that they're transmitting information about what Earth is like back to their home planet. And no matter where you're from as a star seed, you're transmitting codes from your place into the Earth grid. So it's this two-way street. Okay. Let's go over a few benevolent ETs. Um, the Pleiadians. Okay. Might have heard of them. They come from the seven Pleiadian sisters in Taurus, right? What do they look like? They're tall, fair skin, blonde, silver white hair, piercing blue eyes. Like if you ever saw a Pleiadian in the street, you, it would be unmistakable because you would just see these piercing, piercing blue eyes that would like stare into your soul essentially. And you would just know that this is not an earth uh, being, right? They're friendly, they're loving, they're welcoming on their planets. They have these very tight-knit communities, okay? They are really into community farming and schooling. They like living in earth homes. Uh, there's some cities. They eat fruits and nutrition drinks. They live a very long time. They step into a new regenerated body halfway through, okay? And they have a conscious death experience. For Earth, they've helped to direct souls towards Earth from Orion's belt. They've saved people from the Atlantean catastrophe. They were a big part of that. And uh, souls that, you know, had chosen to not basically go down with the ship when the Atlantean catastrophe took place and actually to be, uh, you know, elevated to somewhere else. The Pleiadians were part of that. They managed the Mount Shasta portal. I can't wait to go there with my group in May and uh, say hi to the Pleiadians and the Telosians. They oversee the Akashic records for this part of the galaxy, but my understanding is not the whole galaxy. They work through channelers. This might be what they look like. Okay. Um, not by not might be it, it it's pretty close um the only thing is 
usually we see an emblem. Like when I take people on the regression journeys, usually we see some sort of emblem emblem on there. Um, star seeds, Pleiadian star seeds are healers. Type one indigos, which are the grid workers, they're interested in exploring romance, sex, and relationships, family dynamics, and addictions. Okay, for um, a very specific reason, every single um, Pleiadian star seed that's a woman that I've ever encountered in this current ascension life, she grew up in a family where she was misunderstood and she attracted innumerable uh, narcissistic men into her life. Why? Because she's meant to bring the Pleiadian divine feminine frequency to earth and imprint it in the grid. And through the experience of dealing with the shadow masculine, the dark masculine, that's what challenges her to do that. Okay. It's a little different for Pleiadian men. Although a lot of Pleiadian men uh, are gay in their essential life for the same reason. And a lot of them also have to experience kind of a similar thing where they're, you know, forced to face like narcissistic men, maybe a narcissistic controlling father. Okay. Syrians, that's me. Say moi. Um, where they come from, Sirius A and B, or Sirius C, which is uh, quite an interesting thing, which I would love to talk about sometime on on one of these platforms. Sirius C is a fascinating story because you can't see it, but it's there, right? Uh, what do they look like? They're tall, they're blue, they're turquoise, they're green skin, no hair, um, green or golden eyes or turquoise eyes, wearing gowns. They're beautiful, but they're blue, and they have no hair. They usually wear jewels here okay sometimes they wear a little crown with jewels on the top of their head um i'll never forget i was uh you know when i lived in brazil i was uh, a fardado at uh, uh santo in santo daime and um i uh you know it was a concentration and uh those of you that know santo daime you know what i'm talking about and uh, at the end of the concentration uh my friend michael from uh, england he turned to me and we were both in that you know post ayahuasca afterglow and he's like Matt, I saw you as this giant, beautiful blue being, like seven feet tall. I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's my Syrian self, Mike. <laughs> um, their planets are these intricate, crowded cities. They build all their buildings out of the most beautiful crystal. And um, they enjoy wonderful uh, community potlucks. Uh, they love humor and comedy. Why do you think I think I'm funny? A good portion of you out there do think I'm funny. Those of you that are coming to the Conscious Life Expo, you might, you might see me perform stand-up comedy. We shall see. You might. Wink, wink. Um, so I think I'm funny. But anyways, all Syrians think we're funny, and a lot of us actually are funny. A lot of comedians are Syrians. A lot of actors are Syrians. Um, be, why? Because that's part that Sirius is very associated, associated with the Leo consciousness. Okay. And they like to teach their children actually on their planet, the stories of their people, um, the stories of the, the galaxy through comedy and through, through drama as well. Okay. So that's why a lot of Sirius star seeds are goofy and funny. Okay. Um, what do they do for Earth? They built the pyramids. We talked about that on uh, Thursday. They keep a blockade around the planet. Okay. They, again, there's, there's lots of contracts and galactic laws that explain why there is uh, not, why they're not coming in and basically removing the reptilians from the planet. Okay. And just kicking them out. There's a reason why. The reason is, is because it would, uh, it would tinker with our karma in a, a negative way in a way that would re reverberate and actually have it would leave like a long lasting negative karmic imprint on us as a human collective if they were to interfere too much the pleiadians made the mistake of interfering too much in um atlantean times and it backfired so none of the benevolent ets are are actually directly tinkering with earth affairs they're protecting the Earth from further infiltration. That is allowed by the um, the Galactic Federation, okay, and the councils. The Syrians are in charge of that. The Syrians have a blockade around Earth to protect the Earth from any further infiltration from negative beings, okay? They transmit energy through uh, crystal deposits. They work through channelers like myself. 
I direct channel the um, I direct channel the Syrians. They are incarnated and involved with whales and dolphins. Um, star seeds are like they uh, again they're funny or they think they're funny, right? They're attracted to water. I am obsessed with water. I love water. I love being by the water. I love being in the water. Okay, my you know I don't think it's a mistake. Like I had that spiritual awakening coming out of the shower with the blue avian, right? I have my best ideas come to me in the shower. So Syrians are very uh, attracted to water. Um, I don't know uh, if, if Alan's on, but I was trying to convince him that he's a Syrian, and I believe he could, he very well could be. And, and he's like, oh, my God, yeah, I do love water. I do love blue, right? The color blue, we're, we're very attracted to the color blue as well, and also working with crystals. Arcturians. Arcturians come from the Bootsis constellation, okay? The star Arcturus, or around there. Okay, they're short people. They're blue or purple, no hair, black eyes, okay? The Syrians have like kind of bigger, like blue eyes. The the Arcturians look similar, except they've got these like black eyes. They're stern. They're logical. Their planets are these intricately gridded cities with sacred geometry, very crowded usually. They also have a lot of space stations, and a lot of people on the, the star seed regression sessions have actually seen themselves not going to an Arcturian planet per se, but actually to a space station. They don't need to consume anything physical except under special circumstances. They help to protect sacred wisdom on the planet, and they work through channelers. Uh, what star seeds are like? They're cerebral, intelligent, analytical. They're good with math and science. Um, Orion beings, I talked a little bit about. They come from Orion's belt. They look very human. Okay. Uh, so very similar to Earth, except they have more environmentally friendly technologies. Starseed Orions are very investigative, truth seekers, and honest. It's very scorpionic vibration. Blue avians, of course, look like big blue birds. They're friendly, loving, welcoming, hum and welcoming and humorous on their planets. Uh, they generally have tropical planets. They live in giant tree houses. They eat these giant worms, bugs, and leaves. They're just really wonderful beings. They grow colors on their wings through accumulating experience and wisdom. And what they do for Earth, they're involved with ancient Egypt, Thoth. Okay, Thoth is a blue avian. Uh, and uh, star seeds are very innovative, focus on birds, and enjoy air travel. Okay, blue avians are very creative and innovative. I think this is a really accurate um, AI drawing of a, a blue avian. Lyrans. Lyrans come from Lyra. They look like humans with lion or cat heads. And there's also more like human-looking Lyrans. They're friendly, loving, welcoming, humorous down to Earth. What's it like on their planet similar to Earth with more advanced environmentally uh, friendly technology? They love food. Okay, Lyran starseeds usually love cooking, love exploring different cuisines from around the planet, and they love... Um, they love just uh, food in general. They love they love exploring culture through food. Uh, they're involved with human DNA and cats and working through channelers. Okay, star seeds uh, are very earthy. Enjoy the five senses. I think this is a pretty accurate representation of a lyron mantis. Mantis beings look like these br these big praying mantises. And sometimes people are afraid of them or think they're like negative beings, but they're really loving, care caring, and wise. Uh, they live in these beautiful huts amongst nature, a very simple life. They send healing vibrations through sound frequencies of parts of the galaxy through holographic pools. And uh, the star seeds are very creative. They're very in the sound of music, offbeat, bringing uniqueness to the world. This is a decent, I think, representation. Uh, they don't look that mean, though. They look very nice. Vegans, I'm just going to run through these very quickly, and we're going to wrap up and send it to uh, Flo. But uh, Vegans are from the Vegas star. Okay, the Yael, which we talked a little bit about on Thursday's panel, go back and watch that. All right, uh, they are going to be, they're the ones that did the Phoenix Lights, and they're the ones that are going to really welcome us to the Galactic uh, Federation uh, when the time is right. The Zeta Reticulans, again, these are the ones that people mistake for greys. Okay, they look exactly like greys, big bulbous heads. They have bigger heads than the negative greys, but they're very friendly. They're just very unemotional. So that's why people mistake them. Cassiopeians come from the Cassiopeia constellation, very tall humans, okay, similar to Pleiadian in a lot of ways, animal lovers. The tall whites are like 10 feet tall, very angelic looking, and they're very empathic. Okay, and then either, these are some other possibilities. I'm not going to go through these, but Antarians. Andro if you're from the Andromeda galaxy originally, as a lot of Milky Way star seeds are, there's literally a, a trillion or more stars in the, in the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, you could be from any any quadrant, any rim of the Andromeda galaxy. But these, these are some other ones, Sasani, Sasani, Bintaki, Yargans, 
Venusians, Martians, Maldekians, Polarians, Adarians, and Alpha Centaurians.